this is a, a theme that, that comes up um, often is the David versus Goliath theme. And I figured, you know, it's Saturday morning. Why not start off with biblical imagery? Um, but this is actually a really important theme because this is all about uh, a little bit. We try not to use the term underdog too much, but it's, it's a lot of it is about uh, unexpected unexpected strengths, um, unconventional marketing. These are things that we're going to go over, and they're going to come up time and time again. This particular example is kind of an interesting one because it's not about strength. It's not just about speed, but it's also about smarts, and it's about tools. So it's like, well, listen, you know, if, you, if I'm not wearing armor and you hit me once, I'm done. <coughs> but without the armor, I can move around faster, and I've got this slingshot and I know how to use it really well. I don't know how to use a sword. It's bigger than I am. There's no way I'm going to be able to fight you with it. So a lot of that, a lot of the things that we're going to go over, like these themes, are really about um, using your using your brains and figuring out what what are the best tools to use. So this is a little bit of the underdog theme. These are all relatable images um, for one reason or another that that you guys can relate to. So. Uh, as a, an Oakland resident and a Warriors fan, I take personal offense to this, but listen, it, they, they had a much longer stretch of you know, not winning than we did, so we'll let, we'll let them have this one. Bernie lost, the Bears lost, William Wallace was killed. Uh, thank you, thank you, Alan, appreciate that. Anyway, <laughs> it's imagery that people can understand at 10.05 oh, okay. on Saturday morning. Thank you very much, okay? Um, but anyway, so the whole point is that this is a this is a trope that we all like. You know, we really we want to get behind the small guy. We want to get behind the underdog. Sometimes if you have two horses in a race that you don't have neither of them are your horses, you're like, I just want to go with the I just want to go with the guy that like needs my support more. Okay? It's a feeling that we all have, and there's a lot of times you can go to a party here at Tails where if it's like you know, a big brand, you're like, oh, whatever, it's this big brand, they have a ton of money. If you go to like something that a small brand does, you get really excited about it. You're like, oh, this small brand. It's, it's, a, it's an emotional thing that we, we, we all like to get behind them. So just a quick intro um, so that you know who's in front of you. So my name is Donnie Ronen. Uh, I do food, wine, and spirits education. Half my time is as director of education for Liquid Kitchen, and I do uh, the cocktails and the training and the education for all the Fairmont hotels. And then the rest of it is actual product development and strategy for uh, small brands, operators of all kinds. Uh, Ryan Malkin, here to my left, is an attorney. So if you guys say anything or do anything that you shouldn't be doing this morning, it's not really going to go well. He's noting everything. And you're being audio video recorded by Tails, so just FYI. But has gone from you know working as uh, assistant DA in New York all the way to um, working as counsel for Pernod Ricard and now helps develop small brands all over the world, including Dragos right here from Nova Fogo. Um, they met when we started talking about the seminar, and now the two of them work together, which I love that. Thank you, Donnie. Absolutely. Um, Jagosh is the principal owner of Nova Fogo, which is uh, a zero waste, uh, sorry, it's a cachaça that's made in southern Brazil, a uh, zero waste distillery right on the edge of the rainforest, and uh, you guys will have a cocktail with that today. Uh, to his left is Dan Gasper from Distill Ventures. All of you have the Distill Ventures uh, deck of cards in front of you, which are Filled, filled with brilliant little bits of wisdom, um, and he's going to be here talking about what uh, you know investors or incubators are looking for in small brands. To his left, oh, there we go. Oops, sorry. Super sexy photo of Alan Katz that I really could not help but put up here. I'm sorry. It's just it's so. Look at there's smoke on the bottom. It's smoky and sexy. Exactly. Shabbat shalom, everybody. So uh, he is the founder of New York Distilling Company and also the director of mixology for Southern Wine and Spirits in New York. And so he has a unique perspective, not only as a small brand, but as honestly as working with small brands myself has been a champion for small brands in the powerhouse that is now Southern slash Glazers. So uh, it's great to have everybody here. So give it up for them. Thank you for showing up. You're going to notice a theme throughout 
our presentation today. Um, it's predominantly 80s movies that have an under underdog theme. So hopefully you guys are caffeinated enough to see this thing like as it goes through. Everybody knows what this is from, right? Shout it out. More specifically? Thank you. Who's the, who's the nerd who knew it was part two? Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Come on. Exactly. Yeah, you can tell by his tiki shirt. Yeah. Okay. So the first question I have, oh, hold on a second. Sorry, this mic is kind of wacky. Uh, the first question I have is basically for my two gentlemen who have uh, supplier experience. And that is, what are, so Dragos, what are some mar like unconventional marketing strategies that you have used that have been successful? Yeah, well, you do have to do marketing, right? You have to, as a brand, you have to put some money towards that and some effort. And it's a matter of where you dedicate those resources to go. And we chose to do it in a way that signifies us and our values. And uh, they relate to balance. We, we have a zero waste distillery. We care about balance in the rainforest. We thought we'd extend that balance over to the selling market as well. And when I entered the market, I had a lot of my new friends, bartenders, uh, kind of withering away around me, burning out because of all the excess around the temptation, the bad schedules, the, uh, uh, the, the bad eating uh, uh, policies. So I just thought this is going to be really difficult if I have to renew relationships with clients every year because they moved on to another career, right? And I also don't like to see my friends going away. So we thought, why don't we put these marketing dollars towards helping them stay healthy and perhaps stick around the industry for a while so that we can replenish those uh, loyalties every year as opposed to starting new ones. So that led to a series of what we call sweat sessions where we host yoga classes for bartenders or sponsor soccer teams around the country, do uh, spinning classes, baseball games, indoor climbing, foraging trips, all sorts of things all around the country for different bartending communities and even a soccer tournament we've done at cocktail weeks before. Pales of Cocktail has been a great partner for this because we've done two 5K runs here in the years past, and this year we've actually done one run and one workout every day, Tuesday through Saturday. And that kind of stuff, you know, is very unusual, I think. When we started a few years ago, nobody was doing it. Now there's a lot of velocity towards that, which is beautiful to see. I feel like perhaps we've inspired that a little bit. But we're seeing people come back and say, thanks for what you do. Uh, when I see the same people come back over and over, that means we've been successful, right? And, and so we're going to stick with this. It's what defines us. It's, uh, it's what we think we can actually achieve. It, 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 we know this world of wellness. So uh, we're going to stick with it. And, and I think that the loyalty of the bartenders is coming back into sales too. So eventually everybody wins. It's also kind of a driving force. I don't know how many of you were like on your way here this morning and you saw people who had already finished their run and you're like, really guys? We have some like, runners in the audience right now. Oh, yeah? yeah Raise they, your hands. They, they look nice. Nice. Okay, good. But uh, I remember after the, that, that first, the 5K, yeah. we like, came back. Uh, you get to the front of the hotel, yeah. and then you get a lot of really like, concerned, dirty looks from people. Like, what have you? <laughs> but it's, it's also like a good driving force. There were people that saw it and then <coughs> joined again later because you know, it was an inspiration. And so. I would say that probably the, there are more people like you running People on the, on the selling side of things realize you have to have staying power in the industry and, and do that. It's hard to get the young bartenders to come in to do the runs because they're here to party. But ultimately, they go past the table. They see it every day. They hear that it was fun. They hear from a friend. Perhaps next year they'll do it too. He starts out with an apology. Hey, Robert, I'm sorry I didn't come this morning, but I'll try again tomorrow. That's good. That's progress. And I, I feel like we're, making, we're, we're going in the right direction. Uh, Alan. Uh, your perspective, not only as a small brand, but also from the distributor side, unconventional sure. strategies that have worked. We have uh, quite literally uh, no marketing budget. Our, our marketing budget uh, for this year is $125,000, give or take. But for us, sales and marketing includes any amount of travel, printing brochures, postcards. Uh, it's a catch-all as a bucket for whatever might fall into that, uh, those necessities. Uh, for us, we have a plant. That is our sales and marketing capacity. So we have a distillery in Brooklyn, and we use that to reveal, to create scenarios that would be interesting, unusual, different, 
uh, to bartenders, retailers, media, and consumers. But our focus is predominantly the trade, as it has been since we opened our doors about four and a half years ago. Uh, an example I can give is about a year and a half ago, we launched a rock and rye uh, made with whiskey that we make in Brooklyn. Uh, and most people have no idea what rock and rye is, or their connection to it might be a father or a grandfather or grandmother that had, in all likelihood, an artificially flavored rock and rye that might not even be made from whiskey completely as the base. And so we invited people in on a monthly basis to make their own rock and rye. One, it let people know, hey, we're a, we've been making gins and whiskeys since we started. Uh, but that, hey, we'll wave our hands a little bit. Please know that we're also a rye whiskey company. Rock and rye. If you say it quickly, you're not even sure what it is. Rock and rye. That it's rye whiskey with rock candy sugar, in our case, Bing cherries, orange peel, and a little bit of cinnamon bark. But we let people taste ours, uh, made cocktails with it, gave them our perspective on the product, and then let them make their own that they could say, oh, this is interesting. Now I have a sensibility of how it's made. Uh, they might keep all the ingredients in the little bottle. It costs us virtually nothing except products that we've already made or already have on site. And they could say, well, let it macerate for the weekend, for a few hours, for a week, see what happens. And it enabled us in a very inexpensive way to, one, as I said, let people know and understand what rock and rye is, and that it's not just a catch-all to throw ingredients in a bottle, that you've got to pay particular attention to the proof of the whiskey or the ingredients that you use, uh, et cetera. Um, so I enjoy those types of things with all the small brands, ours included, that I have the opportunity to work with. Uh, on the larger scale, there's a related context, and I'm always encouraging uh, large brands through the distributor, through Southern, uh, to equally reveal something about the brand. This has happened increasingly over the last maybe three, four, five years. But historically, uh, you know, if you go back 10, 15 years ago, everything was very secretive. This is our whiskey. This is our gin. People didn't necessarily want to tell you what the botanicals were, for example, or the process in which something is made. The truth is, in my opinion, uh, if it's a new product to market, we want to taste people and taste them aggressively. But if it's a gin, if it's a whiskey, if it's a rum, my feeling is when we interact with bartenders and retailers in particular, and other members of the trade, they don't need my help to taste the product. I want to give them information. I want to leave them a sample and let them evaluate it, and hopefully follow up with me with any relevant questions. That being said, any information that I can give them about how it's made, where the wood is sourced for whiskey. Most of our barrels are sourced from Missouri, we're now looking into barrels from South America. Maybe there'll be a difference. So that I can give them individual samples of whiskey and say, this is what comprises our product. It, it helps ingratiate the people who are buying our products to say, there's nothing that's hidden. We really have an eagerness to share with anyone that's interested, any and everything about our products, frankly, down to the recipes including the percentages of botanicals in our gins. If someone asks, I give them the recipe. That's my Thank you. stalwart suggestion. So, you know, once he has all four of these drinks, you probably can get the full recipe to all of his products. Yeah. So just keep that in mind. Exactly right. Um, Ryan, so not only from, not just from a legal perspective, but uh, from your experience having working, worked with a lot of small brands, um, where do you see the small brands being able to navigate that marketing space where big brands can't? Uh, from my perspective, it's actually more on the, uh, a little bit more on the on-premise, and I think Dan will probably talk later, he says something about going deep, not wide, and usually small brands tend to try to concentrate on their home market and wherever you may live. Um, if the, in Ellen's case, it would be Brooklyn, but you know, owning your backyard, and a lot of times you get a lot of the uh, bartenders and friends in the community to support your product, and you can get a lot more placements. I, I find smaller brands, if you look at menus, um, maybe not, not in the corporate world uh, in Fairmont, but in the you know, local bars, you'll have a lot of small brands in the menu, and those are not necessarily because of support and money that you're giving to the accounts, albeit pay to play is illegal in the US, but they do it through relationships, and you get placements that the bigger brands will have to put a lot of money into support for. So I see it more on being able to uh, leverage relationships and friendships and people wanting to kind of support the underdog and not require 
you know, five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars in support throughout the year for placements, and just do it because you're a small brand. They want to help you out as they see you grow. Okay. Um, have you have you seen any like good examples of that? Uh, I mean, I see it all the time. Every menu that I look at, and I see mm -hmm. a small brand where I know the person locally, um, and they're supporting those small brands largely because they're local and they're good relationships and obviously good product, but they want to support small brands and see them grow. One good, one thing that um, Ryan said that was great, you said many great things, my mistake. One of the many great things that Ryan said that was helpful was uh, I was just in Las Vegas for work recently and, um, you know, walk, going through a bunch of hotels uh, that not important which ones they were, but big hotels and going to maybe 20 different outlets and not seeing one small brand, not one. So it's like someplace, you know, the corporate is the, the corporate is, it's a, it's kind of a big, it's a big issue. That's, um, it's really difficult to get that kind of market penetration as, as a small brand. Um, and we do, yes. Okay. And we do, uh, we will get into that a little bit more down the road as far as, um, market penetration and the things that you have to do, you know, in order to get that kind of growth. Uh, the question I have for Dan is, and probably what a lot of these guys want to know, <laughs> is what do you look for in small brands as far as, you know, when you're looking for the right investment? Um, so, um, so we look around the world. We look for uh, lots of different businesses um, all over the world. Um, the three things that we particularly look for, um, the first thing is, uh, is distinctivity. Um, if you're um, looking at the market today and just planning to be one step ahead of the market, then it's going to be very quickly the rest of the market catches up with you. But if you're doing something truly differentiated, truly distinctive, whether that's your pack, whether it's your liquid, whether that's how you market, um, you're going to be able to stay ahead of the pack and they're not going to be able to replicate you as quickly. So that's certainly, distinctiveness is one. Um, the second is, is opportunity. Um, are you really clear with what your business is going to go and do? How is it going to um, get into the market and do something uh, and find a unique space? It's a pretty crowded market. Um, it's not simple out there. There's a lot of people starting businesses. So if you're going to grow it, you've got to have something which is a very clear opportunity that you're heading for. Um, but the most important thing we look for, and, and I have to say it's, it's, uh, it's the driving force in what we do, is, is the entrepreneur. Um, to be successful uh, in the global drinks business, uh, there are measure, many different measures of success, but uh, to be successful, to become uh, a nationally or internationally recognized product is an incredibly difficult task. And uh, finding the entrepreneurs who have the, uh, the guts, the grit, the enthusiasm, the skills, um, that is what we look for as entrepreneur. Um, and the number of businesses we've come across who we think have a wonderful opportunity and maybe have a great liquid or a really distinctive um, proposition where the entrepreneur is, we don't think will probably go the distance. That's unfortunately nine times out of 10 where we don't get to invest in a business. So a uh, human capital, was anyone at the Heartbreak Hotel seminar the other day? That was also early, so we apologize for that too. <laughs> but um, that was, the human capital aspect came up a lot. Um, it's really, it's w much larger than, than you think it is. Obviously, for, for small business owners, for, for suppliers, um, you know, building your team, we're gonna, again, we're gonna get to growth later, building your team is huge. And now that you know that on the flip side, for those who are looking to make investments in you, the you part is the most important part. Obviously, it has to be like a business that's going to fly or that someone can look at and say, oh, I think this is gonna, this is gonna work in th three years. My return on investment is gonna, maybe it's gonna come in three and a half, four, maybe even five years. But if the same thing about like that feeling that we get about the underdog, if they feel like the right person is behind this, the entrepreneur, as you put it, it goes an incredibly long way. And which naturally seg segues us directly into differentiating your product, which is something that Dan brought up. It's not only differentiating your product, but also differentiating yourself. Um, this is a gentleman right here, self-made self -made man, um, who became a multi-multi-millionaire because he differentiated himself. He thought differently, he thought outside the box. I'm talking about the character, not Rodney Dangerfield, but also not an inside the box kind of guy himself either. Um, one of the things that, that uh, Dan just brought up was, uh, the important things is actually standing away from the pack. Um, can you think of like a really great example of when you were looking at maybe two different projects and you're like, this one 
stands out a lot more because of such and such reason? Yes, yeah, sure. So um, uh, about uh, about two years ago, we um, uh, Australian whiskey uh, in Europe is quite <coughs> a hot category. So we thought we'd have a look at what was going on Australian whiskey, and we looked at lots of different in Tasmania, which is a little island off the south coast of Australia. There's lots of great whiskies coming out of there. Um, and so we went down to go and have a look at what the people were doing and talked to lots of different people. And what we found was that actually a lot of those people were, um, were really just trying to emulate scotch. They were doing it in Tasmania, but they were really kind of ignoring everything that they had in Tasmania, which is an amazing, amazing island and, and very, very different to the rest of the world. And they were kind of not recognizing that at all. They were just saying, we'll make kind of a Tasmanian Scot Scottish whiskey. And then we came across uh, a business that we invested in about a year ago, uh, a gentleman called uh, David Vitali, who runs a, a whiskey company in Melbourne called Starwood. Um, David was very clear. He didn't want to make scotch. He didn't want to apologize for being in Australia making scotch. He wanted to make Australian whiskey. And he wanted to use all of the different uh, aspects that Australia has to offer to make a really distinctive Australian-style whiskey. So for instance, uh, he's based in Melbourne, where um, they call it the city with four seasons in one day. It can freeze overnight, be uh, 100 degrees in the day. Um, so his barrels work incredibly differently to a lot of other places in the world. Uh, and he uses uh, Barossa Valley red wine casks from start to finish. These are barrels that are used as planters if they don't get <coughs> used um, for whiskey. And as a result, he's got a really, really distinctive, different whiskey. And that's the kind of distinctiveness we look for. Okay. Um, to interrupt this thought a little bit, Alan, do you want to tell everybody about this cocktail? Certainly. Uh, this is a simple gimlet variation into the topic at hand. It's made with our Navy Strength Gin. And if I might take a minute of your time mm -hmm. uh, to the, ti the timer's on. OK, ready? So go for it. Yeah. Go. Uh, Good. Distinctivity is a very interesting <laughs> word to me, because if you look around the landscape, you can have a fascinatingly original whiskey, for example, from Tasmania, uh, which I think is very interesting and exciting. But then we want to, I think, play in the realm where people are attracted to our products. Um, you know, to go so far out on a limb, you've sort of got to judge how distinctive, how original can you offer something and still be relevant, acceptable, I guess the easiest word is comfortable to the bar community, consumer community, so that they understand what you're doing. Um, this is our Navy Strength Gin called Perry's Tot. It's 114 proof. Navy Strength Gin has a long history. When we released it in 2011, late 2011, there hadn't been a Navy Strength Gin commercially available in the United States in nearly a century. At the end of the day, it's gin. Everybody knows what that is. But it's distinctive enough that I could at least approach a bartender, have them taste it, and say, it has a rational purpose behind your bar when you're going to have a slew of the stalwart brands, of course. Um, but this might have an interesting place on your back bar as well. Um, so you know, distinctivity is, I think, has a, a cautionary sliding scale as well so that there's a level of common sense involved as well. What, so what is in? This is Perry's Tot Navy Strength Gin, fresh lime juice, cinnamon syrup, uh, cinnamon bark syrup, a uh, little bit of simple syrup, and Bitterman's Hellfire Shrub. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that we talked about also about uh, you know differentiating yourself, uh, this is something that that you know, Ryan and I had talked about separately um, about bottle choice, about package. And uh, he made a good point that a lot of times we, as you know, a small brand, can't just go and you know, buy that mold. For those of you who have done that before, <laughs> you, just, you can hear the cash register going. And yeah, and Dragos is, of course, giggling because he has a very distinct bottle and knows how much it costs to make a mold. Um, story about that too. Yes. So uh, that's one. That's my question for you. Is we what we were talking about on the off premise? The great example is someone wants to go and look for something. Sometimes it really is purely visual. It's purely brand. It's purely design. Sometimes we get a little too caught up in that as small brands and put far too much money. And I see a lot of nodding heads or a lot of shaking heads like, oh man, shouldn't have done that. But um, Dragos actually has a good example of how that I works for you. I think packaging is 50% of, uh, of the buying decision at the beginning, uh, at least on the first purchase too. Because you may go into a store, the consumer goes into a store to look for some kind of spice rum. And they're going straight for the place where they know that exists. But off in the corner of their eye, they see this pretty curvy bottle they've never seen before. And that curvy bottle is enough just to, just to 
capture them for 10 seconds, or they move over there, and they start reading about it. They have no idea what cachaça may be, but it's a pretty bottle, and they start reading about it, and it looks very interesting, and it's got a good story on the back. And all of a sudden, they realize they can actually afford this one, too. So they may walk out of that store with two bottles instead of one. That was called an impulse purchase, and that was done solely by the packaging, right? Now, I know that if they take this home, and they open it, and they drink it, they'll love it. They'll become fans for life. But they would have never opened it if the packaging wasn't right. So how do you create good packaging when you are a small brand owner without $100,000 for a mold? That's hard. You know, either you have to go buy something off the shelf or spend a lot of money on, on creating your own design. But we found other ways. You know, it, just, it depends on how hard you want to look, how far you want to go. We had the same issues in Brazil. There are three glass manufacturers, and they all want the gigantic minimum quantities and gigantic amounts of money for, for, uh, for the molds. <coughs> But we said, no, we're not going to do that. How about if we make the bottles by hand at the beginning? It'll cost more per bottle, but that mold is not going to cost very much. And uh, as you know, our master distiller is in the audience there. He may remember that we, uh, we, found, uh, we found a little shop in a terrible neighborhood in Sao Paulo. This man, this old man in a garage basically said, yeah, I'll make you a mold for $3,000. So we made that mold for $3,000. We took it to a glass shop in Curitiba, which recycled glass off the streets of Curitiba, broke it in small pieces with hammers, tossed it in the oven, and then pulled it out on a, on a hot iron and poured it in our $3,000 single bottle mold, one by one, and then blew air into it and opened it up. And there goes a bottle. Well, 50% of the time, there was a good bottle there. And, <laughs> and, and, and that good bottle rate. cost us a lot of money, right? But we got started on $3,000. We designed the, the bottle ourselves, and we just kind of went that extra effort, and we were able to get started. And at this point, we've gone, we've gone to where the glass shop couldn't keep up. We're making these by the machine, but still from recycled glass. We like that story of progress that we've created. We've supported local businesses, and now we're supporting other, other businesses. And that works. It's just you have to have persistence, in my opinion. And, and also the, the going outside the box theme with this guy uh, works as well because you ended up being able to tell a story about how you were cleaning it glass off the streets. The yeah, I think we're talking about differentiation of product, and that is different from differentiation of brand, but they're so related, right, because the brand tells the story of the product. That became an obvious part of the story we're talking, talking about the brand. By the way, this burlap here is made from recycled plastic bottles from, picked up from the streets of Sao Paulo, too. That's pretty cool, right? It's also like kids play soccer in the street, no shoes. And you're able to sweep that glass off the street and then you use the glass to turn it into bottles. That's going in the brochure. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> this, is, this is the think tank right here. You guys were all here for it. <laughs> um, by the way, has anyone ever called Melbourne the Chicago of Australia? Because I've never heard that, that term of like the, the weather changing that drastically in a day. Uh, I don't know. Does Chicago have amazing food as well? Uh, anyone yeah, here from sure. Chicago? Great food. Yeah. There we go. Then, may, then maybe we should maybe we should stop. Yeah. Well, and then maybe somebody in Chicago should start like laying a bunch of barrels down. Um, I think Koval. There, I think this, there might be somebody yeah. doing that. Yeah. yeah just <laughs> one one or two here. <laughs> okay. Um, and then as far as uh, as Ryan goes, like differentiating your product, you've worked with a lot of small brands. Um, what are some of of the ways that like people came up with the really great ideas to differentiate their product? Uh, partially trial and error. Um, you know, someone will come to my come to me with an idea, for, and they want to say, call their brand, you know, X, and then that's the only thing they want to do. And they have all the marketing, they have the labels ready to go, and then we'll try to trademark it. But somebody else has that brand, <coughs> and so they have to start from scratch and uh, pick a new name, and, and you know, so I think they, in sort of times when you need to make a decision and you need to just sort of. Uh, make a call. I think sometimes people have really creative ideas, and I've had a few people who they scrapped everything and started over and had amazing ideas. Better, okay. better ideas the second time, right? Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's like when you you come up against a wall. You know, those are the those are the times like when the creative juices start flowing for sure. And it's it's tough in general. It's t I know it's tough for Ryan because his his role when he's brought in after somebody's already done a work, a lot of his job is like the want wah work he's, you know he comes and he's like man i gotta be debbie downer on this one again like guys you can't because of this name or this thing or whatever but uh, we we will get into like the positive aspects of the things he gets to do by helping people at the beginning when they come to him early when he can really like save their hides so we will get away from the want wah aspect of this not to worry um 
Alan, there's something you wanted to add in there? I, I saw there was a way of... Uh, uh, well, I could. You know, it's an interesting thing. It's, I you can always add something. I know that uh, you can I'll always add something. Again, I think you have to come to this, particularly when you're launching a new brand, and know who your purposeful audience is. Our bottles are very simple. You know, our aspect is we're distilling it, we're making it. We wanted to be able to launch at what we felt were, from the standpoint of a small distillery, at extraordinary prices, that people would look at it and have the opportunity <coughs> to buy it. People meaning bartenders. That was our go-to market when we started. That's not the case for everyone, but that's who we were looking to appeal to when we first launched the brand. So we have a very simple Bordeaux bottle. We put some energy, good energy we thought and think, uh, into the labeling process and design. And now, nearly five years later, we're in process of creating a bottle design that would be proprietary to us. It's where we could afford to launch the product and all the costs that we all have as either brand owners or distillery owners, there are many, uh, and you want to have a little bit in reserve, of course. This was our most direct route to market, knowing that it was an easy bottle in hand wherever you wanted to grab it for a bartender and that appealed to them. And now as we get into uh, retail accessibility and consumer marketing in an increasing level, now has been the right time for us to create what we think will be, you know, for the next 10 years, maybe longer, a proprietary uh, bottle that will be wholly ours. And that's what a lot of small brands end up doing. It's like at the beginning, you use what you have. So, uh, I mean, Alan brought up a really great point about the knowing, knowing, know your audience is my personal mantra, just because like I have to be in front of so many different audiences all the time and they change. Even at one hotel, I can have eight outlets and each outlet is vastly different from the other. They have different clientele and they themselves, like either the bartenders or the managers, totally different people to talk to. Um, so that's huge. And then the other thing about bottling and, and money that you put into that in general, if you don't have that at the beginning, I mean, the important part is that you love what you're doing and that the product you're making is great. So, I mean, yeah, you, you can't start it out without a, a marketing budget. There's too many times I'm sure that all of you guys have heard th those stories from your, you know, with your individual experience. And I'm sure um, Alan can come up with, you know, a million stories of small brands that came to you and like, hey, I want to launch in New York. And you're like, great. Like, what sort of marketing budget do you have? Uh, what is that? I don't know what it, what does that mean? So that can be uh, something that all of you who have small brands need to figure out what that percentage is that you can afford and actually make sure that in order to, you can always differentiate yourself and there's a lot of, you know, interesting and, you know, low cost ways to do that, but you do have to have some budget put aside for that. Um, I like, if please, I just, one thing that I see some brands do is work with USBG and do bartender competitions, and USBG tends to be relatively inexpensive, whereas like a liquor.com tends to be a little bit more expensive. And so for a relatively little amount of money, you can have a bartender competition locally and get people obviously trying your product, bartenders, and making your product um, maybe that they wouldn't have in the past. So it's one way where I see um, some smaller brands activate locally uh, you know, on a smaller budget. <laughs> it's, a, it's also a great way to, to get the product in front of, a, you know, a pretty specialized crew of people. You really want to get your product in front of bartenders. It's a, it's a great way to do it. Um, a lot of times, at least if you can, when you're going around to different cities and trying to, it was a lot different when we had much, you know, very, like, fewer chapters. And now, uh, I mean, we have chapters everywhere. It's actually really impressive, the growth. While you're traveling or when you're putting together your itinerary, start reaching out to USBG. Thank you for bringing that up. USBG, who are a nonprofit and already have these things, sort of these systems built in to allow you to show your product off, to put some money into a tasting or an event or some kind of seminar and get whoever that is, whether it's you, whether it's your distiller, whether it's your, um, you know, your brand educator in front of you know, a, a great audience that you really want to get in front of. Um, has anyone actually used that route before? Gone, gone from chapter to chapter? Did you find that successful for you? Yeah. I mean, each chapter is very different. Uh, leadership is different, but it's just honestly getting better and better and better. Uh, they're, they're not messing around anymore. They really have a great system that you can put your product into, into place. Dragos. Yeah, I, I want to talk about that too for a second. You were talking earlier about having to put a certain percentage 
of something aside from marketing. And I have to tell you, at the beginning, no, a, any percentage of zero is still zero. So you have to actually have to go above that a little bit, right? But there are ways to do things inexpensively by just sticking with what you know, going into the groups of people that you know already have connections with. And that's actually probably a, a brand creation strategy is that uh, perhaps look within yourself and find out who you are and put those values, those interests into your brand. They will take you to the people you know. We care about a lot of Brazilian things, including soccer. I love soccer. Soccer is what took me to Brazil in the first place. We have a soccer player on our investor team in Brazil. We started out doing soccer games. It was easy. I know how to throw soccer games, right? That didn't cost very much money. So, uh, just By throw, he means put them on, not make a wager. And, That's a yeah, good point. Yeah, just for the record. <laughs> yes, I apologize. I'm still an immigrant. English is still my second or fourth language. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, have, I actually have a great example of a brand from the Northwest that did just that. It's called Pendleton, and it's put together by a distillery from Hood River, Oregon. It's a Canadian whiskey. It's made in Alberta. Uh, it's bottled in Oregon, and it has a rodeo theme. And it's only about a two-hour drive from Pendleton, Oregon, which is the home of the largest rodeo in the West. And it, everything about that bottle says rodeo. The label, the, the concept of the whiskey itself, and guess how they started branding that? Taking it to rodeos, connecting with people they knew. And it just started to, to spread like fire. That was a great start, amazing start. <coughs> then those people will go and tell their friends who perhaps don't go to rodeos about it. And they made uh, the, their consumers their salespeople. That is an amazing tool for a small brand is to transform your guests, your consumers into your salespeople, your brand stewards. There's no freer, no less expensive cost of marketing than than, than creating that kind of value. Um, so the, does everybody have the drink? So this is called La Perla Numero Dos. So does anyone had La Perla cocktail before? I, it's one of my favorite modern classics. It's uh, Jacques Bizet in it. Um, when he was, is he still working for Partita? I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's, I feel like it's still going. Um, he was looking for, you know, we use a lot of sherry in the Bay Area. He loved sherry. This was his actual competition cocktail for the Copa de Jerez competition back, I think, in 2008. And um, what we did is actually did like a small brand twist on this. So this is Fortaleza Repo, um, Cabeza tequila, uh, Manzanilla sherry, and then the St. George spiced pear. So we wanted to have like a nice, you know, it's boozy stirred cocktail, but it's like nice and clean and light because we lightened it up with sherry. Um, and it has, you know, pear in it, so it's kind of for breakfast, right? Sort of? Yeah, close enough. Alan. This is a perfect example of, of something else I think is valuable to take advantage of in knowing where your product not only fits in the marketplace, but what are the range of complementary spirits or other ingredients that might work well with your product. So, you know, in the USBG route or something similar, that's great. Honestly, in our marketing budget, it wasn't there. But we've tried to, if not partner, collaborate with other brands, big and small, to say, how can we do things together, whether it's in-store tastings or bartender programs. By programs, I mean visitations, just pounding the pavement and getting out there with a batch cocktail in your bag and saying, can I get behind your bar? Do you mind stirring this or shaking this off? And tasting it together and having simple, inexpensive cards printed with a range of complementary brands for two purposes, at least. One is, hopefully you're presenting your product, that's our ambition, in the best light possible, but also to present to a buyer specifically, whether it's at a bar, restaurant, or a retailer, hey, I understand what's going on. I'm at this level of expertise within the range and complication of spirits that are now available in the marketplace, and this is why I'm showing it to you in this context. So, um, a great point. Uh, one of the, during one of our conversations, we did have like, the money talks conversation. It's really important that no matter what you're focusing on, quality, education, um, talking to your audience, that you remember that at the end of the day, it still involves you selling product. It still involves someone along the line, if not many people along the chain, making that money. Because if they are, everyone is gonna help you. And that's something that actually come, came up uh, as part of like the distill, um, as part of the, the distill 
motto is that make sure that everyone in the chain is going to make money off of it because then everyone will always help everyone else. As far as partnerships, um, I mean, great examples are work within your distributor because then not only will you have another product that's in the same book out there trying to help sell your product because they go well together and because you work well with that individual, but it can be presented to your distributor sales team as, hey, by the way, are you having a hard time selling Pisco? Are you having a hard time selling this weird liqueur? You know what is amazing together? These two products. It doesn't matter that they're two different suppliers. They're both in that person's book, and you're helping them make their sales. You're helping them make their numbers. They're just going to turn around and, and really appreciate you more for that, and you're going to see uh, you're going to see a jump. Um, that works both for on premise and for off. I mean, you can do something as simple as, here's my calendar. Here are all the holidays coming up. I mean, like real holidays, not like you know National Martini Day, whatever. That works sometimes, but like actual holidays or you know uh, July 4th or something where you know people are going to be going out and having picnics. You're like, this bottle of Pisco and this liqueur and these two cans of Canada Dry make an amazing punch for four people. And like, we did that one time and printed tags, that hang tag, we went into the store and put every, like hang tag on every single necker of, all, of both of those brands. And it showed one bottle of the booze, two bottles of the liqueur, you know, three cans of soda, ice. Like it was, you know, it may have been a little dumb, but it sold out every stupid bottle in that store like every bottle in that store. So any of those little ideas that you get, collaboration is really key and you're also, it's almost like creating brand ambassadors. Those partnerships, those are people that are gonna go out and, and help you. Just like the example Jagish gave with Pendleton as well. Um, you're creating an audience, you're creating pull. So you, like at one point, you have to pull back on your push and let the pull come. You've gotta look state to state as well because yeah. You can go a step further. For example, we experimented uh, with a co-pack with the same distributor in California with a product from Combier Liqueurs. Our gin and Combier Liqueurs in a co-pack. It was legal there. In New Jersey, we've done co-packs with our gin and a tonic because the distributor ships in New Jersey are allowed to sell both even though they're not both alcohol. In New York, they will not co-pack. So knowing those opportunities and what's in your book is That's useful, cool. but if you can find a like-minded relationship with a cocktail promotion, it, it can be You can drink till four, time. but you can't have a gin and tonic sold together. So yes. that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but you can have a gin in a flask. You can, if you bring your own gin in your pocket, you can totally do it, it's fine. It's oh, cool. still not legal though. Why are you, you shouldn't be giving that advice. That's not. That's not allowed. <laughs> oh, okay. can you? <laughs> okay, then no jokes. What? It's instrumental in you know using the alcohol can be used at, at Copac in New York. So it's uh, you know a cup or a, a you know jigger or something like that. Okay, I we, we're learning together this morning. This is good. Thank you. Um, the next topic is playing to your advantages. Uh, we keep segueing right into the right into the next thing. I I will admit. I, this is one of those visuals that I enjoy the most because it immediately told me a story, but I still haven't seen the movie. I know, I know, I know, I understand. Is, has anyone here not seen Real Genius? Okay, fine, I feel the same way about you guys, all right? You better go out and see that movie, one of my favorite movies. Okay, playing to your advantages. So there are, there are advantages to being a small company. There are advantages to being the small guy. Um, sometimes it's, you're able to make your way in. So a uh, great example is we were launching Domaine de Canton in 2008. We all know the sort of like next step of that story. It's since been purchased by Heaven Hill and has really blown up. Um, this is partially relationship and partially because of the fact that it was small and no one sort of knew it. Uh, I gave my sister a call and said, hey, by the way, Slumdog Millionaire is up for a lot of awards this Oscar season. I feel I have this great cocktail called Passage to India Number no. 2 that um, if anyone's ever been to West Restaurant in Vancouver, uh, you know, David Wallowidnik has a great cocktail that he was sort of working on while I was sitting at the bar. And because it's the only place in town that can actually make you a reservation for Vidges, which, which is a great Indian place, um, I was like, why don't you call it Passage to India? 
So uh, it became the passage to India cocktail. It was really great. And they, Canton wasn't there at the time. So I changed it around, used Canton. Great, super easy, fun cocktail with, with garam masala, curry in it. And so I had the conversation with my sister. She's like, actually, I think one of my clients uh, produces um, some Oscar parties. Let me find out. It turns out this woman randomly found this found Canton and would have a little sip of it every night before she went to bed. She was the one who was in charge of the Fox Searchlight party when uh, Slumdog Millionaire won eight out of nine Academy Awards that year. As you can imagine, it was a pretty awesome party. I walked in with a bunch of products, had a table set up. I was like the lame satellite bar. Um, and then there was some vodka that was probably available for a year and then disappeared who paid $10,000 with vitamin water to make drinks with vitamin water. So congratulations to them. That bar was like empty and I could not make enough of these things. And that was zero cost other than my flight, my accommodations and product. Where, I mean, if you, any of you have worked those kinds of things before, that is a very, very big price tag to do any of those kinds of sponsorships. So that's like, you know, that is a relationship thing. That is like, take advantage of the fact that you're small because down the road, you know, that, that under, the love for the underdog might disappear a little bit. Um, Ryan, what are some examples of things that smaller brands, I don't want to say can get away with, but some advantages that they have um, over big brands? I, think, I mean, I think you talked about most of them, but it is the partnerships or sponsorships you can usually get away with paying less or just going in and, and donating product to charity. And so the same sponsorship that you may have to pay 20, 50, even more, $1,000 for if you're a big brand, if you're a small brand and the people like you and, and want to have you there because you may be local to, the, um, to where the festival is or what have you, you can come in for much, 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 much less. A lot of times the organizers change the price based on who you are. So obviously if it's Diageo, they're gonna you know, ask for 50. If you don't have 50, they're gonna take 1,500 because they think that they want you there and, and the, you know, the fans want you there. So um, I see that we, we can negotiate a little bit heavier um, with sponsorships and those sorts of things. Uh, putting the distributor hat on for a moment, I would say push your distributor, whether it's large or small, Push them to the, to the degree that you want to, not that you can, but that you want to. The worst that can happen is that they'll say no. My specific example is Southern Wine and Spirits uh, overseas runs the South Beach Wine and Food Festival and the New York Wine and Food Festival. If you are a large brand from a large distributor to get into the three-day tasting with a table uh, to present your brands costs somewhere in the realm of $5,500 to $9,500 for that three-day act activation. Um, ask if there's an opportunity to, to pay less. Ask if there's a section for craft brands, mm -hmm. boutique brands. This is a really interesting time. Distributors of all sizes are just getting into this realm of understanding the business model of small brands. They don't yet. Okay, they're playing, they're, they're acquiring or, or uh, distributing small brands as if they were the large brands themselves. They want to make 30 points. They want to know whether you're going to have a marketing budget. Are you going to have someone on the street to support the brand? Those are all important things. But look for opportunities and suggest specific opportunities, whatever might make sense for you. In my case, I did have some advantages, if you will, being a part of the organization. But I said, what does it actually cost to have a table on the floor? And it turns out the cost is $650. So I said, can we? And they, they have expenses for the whole festival. They've got to pay these expenses. So they need bigger sponsors. Can we create a scenario for not just my brand, but the range and interest of small brands, craft brands, boutique products, so that they have accessibility for the same audience? And they love the idea. And so again, that might be a lot for some people. But in the context of $5,500 to $650, it's a way to put your hand out and say, I'd like to create an opportunity that's of equal interest to the people who were coming to these events and create a way for you to participate as well. Go ahead, Dragos. I'd like to talk a little more about the word competition that we're using here, because I think that we are in a place and time where small brands are on equal footing with big brands, 
regarding so many different opportunities. And that has to do with the transformation that our world has seen over the last 15 years since the rebirth of the cocktail movement. And I, I, I'm seeing two things happening. Number one, the cocktailians who were in it from the beginning have moved along, have learned so much, have moved on from some of the traditional spirits are now into some of the more esoteric things, trying to get more culturally diverse, looking f to learn about new spirits that nobody's learned about before. Those people are great, and we should stay in touch with those. Uh, but they are willing to, 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 to talk to small producers and learn about them. On the other hand, we have a new generation that's just kind of come of age. They're old enough to drink now, and they're the largest generation of our time. And they consume differently. They don't go into a bar and ask for a particular brand and soda anymore like 10 years ago people used to do. They go into a brand, sit down uh, into a bar, sit down in front of the bar, uh, bartender, and ask the bartender about their favorites. Well, hey, what's new? What do you like? Have you seen this distillery? What's this company's like? Do they have some kind of commitment to a good cause that I should know about? What is the program you're doing with them today? What kind of event do you have? All of a sudden, it becomes an engagement and an experience, right? They want to hear the story of the origin of the spirit. They want to hear that you're a good company doing good things for somebody in the world, yeah? They want to engage in an experience that perhaps somebody from the company is there to handle uh, on behalf of the brand. Well, smaller companies have, are better at that than bigger companies. We are. We can do it better. We are in those situations. We have those origin stories, which always should be pr part of your brand. And therefore, I, f I feel like we have more opportunity in that kind of context. And I, I totally, I, I'd just like to build on what you were saying. The, um, the, uh, the number of um, consumers have changed dramatically, the number of people coming into spirits. So the number of people uh, reaching legal drinking age in uh, America today, there are 10,000 people turning 21 in the US every day. And um, you know, it's growing too. The millennials are actually yeah. going to add about 20 million people to uh, the immigration in the next 10 years. Hugely powerful. And they're looking for what is the purpose of your, br your brand. They're looking beyond the pack and what it says on the front of the bottle, and that is important. But they're looking to see, well, what, why is the founder doing this? What is the, you know, to a lot What's of the, the points story? you make. Yeah, What's the story, right. and what is their purpose in the world today, and how are they helping? So when it comes to competition, I think the only competition is yourself. You're, it's, it's you who's going to win versus you who's going to fail, right? All you have to do is mind your own business. If our competition does something good, we say, great. If our competition does something stupid, we say, great. Right? <laughs> we just move forward because we have so much work, so much opportunity. We have our own story. We are who we are, and eventually we'll pay off. I mean, and at, at the end of the day, well, two things. First of all, hopefully for anybody here, an operator, that's the one, one anybody own a bar or restaurant or bartend in general. Hopefully, uh, I mean, we actually do love all those questions. It's also nice to not have those questions on Friday and Saturday night. Hey, who produced? I have 20 people behind you right now. I'd love to talk to you about my zero waste distillery, but I can't really get into that. Um, one of the things that, that is very cool right now is we have a huge tipping point. And that's, you know, part of what, what Dragos is saying about, like, we are, you know, through a cycle that we don't know how long this cycle is going to be, but we have the people who were, you know, bartenders a decade, a decade and a half, a decade and a half ago, who were the pioneers and had this rough job of teaching everybody all the time and having to go through that all the time. I see a lot of nods out there, um, and so now and it's a little bit easier for like newer bartenders now. They they get more of the stories from the brands, etc. But now we have big companies who are trying to act like small companies. Well, that is super wacky. It's really, it's crazy to see that. It's like a huge company that you know has a lot of money is like looking to act like a small brand. Now, why would anybody do that? Well, because the tipping point is with the consumer. The consumer is asking more questions now. They're looking for more. They want more. Um, and they're not really satisfied. Uh, you know, that is the, when we were talking about the, you know, talking about slash avoiding the underdog theme, it's because of the fact that at one point you're just not gonna be an underdog anymore. You know, if you have the right people, obviously, like people will always support you. However, you're not always gonna be the underdog. Now, to, to Alan's point about something like South Beach Wine and Food Fest or, um, you know, festivals like that, there are a lot of us out there who do sponsorship, work on sponsorship teams for festivals and cocktail weeks and all these great things that are out there who want you to call them. You know, they might have a really big price tag 
they want to work with you. There, you, 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 it has to be reasonable though. You can't come in and be like, well, I know you and you really like my product, so can you do it for free? I can't do it for free because it's literally costing me to do this. However, if you get in early enough and you're prepared, so one of the things that, you know, like the, the Canton Oscar example is, you know, um, luck is opportunity and preparedness. If you have your act together, if you're ready to go, if you're ready to pull the trigger, if you're asking good questions, if you're thinking about like, what your audience is looking for, and if your audience is, for example, a cocktail week or some sort of uh, you know event like that, a lot of the people behind that now they're not mindless drones, they're not corporate monsters. They want to work with small brands. They just need to know that it's something that will actually work. But at one point, I just want to make that um, there was one brand I worked with, and, and they really re they w they weren't in Florida, but they really wanted to do something with our Basel. They thought it was going to blow up their brand and be very important. So we negotiated. Instead of, I think it was $12,000 or $15,000 for the sponsorship, it was a zero sponsorship fee, but they would provide product. They went and they activated and they provided a product for, I think it was 2,000 people. Um, it was expensive in product. And then they never were in Miami in terms of distribution. And so it was completely a waste. And the brand actually has since uh, folded. I haven't heard from them and I don't think they do anything at all. So the, the point I was just going to say is that, you know, just because there's a big event or a big festival, if the people can't go and buy your product after that, then sort of what's the point? It was like Art Basel was the be all end all to them and then you know, there was no follow through because the consumer couldn't get the product. It, it has to be something that makes sense. So it has to be, make sense to you. Like there's, a, there's a lot of flash, in, they paid their bill with you though, right? Yeah. Okay, fine, we're good. Um, there's a lot of flash in the pan, you know, not companies out there, but ideas out there. We get really wooed we really do as small brands, you get, there's a lot of stuff out there that's very attractive. And you're like, here's a great opportunity, but again, it's not luck, it's opportunity and preparedness. You have to, you have to be ready for it. How about the distribution agreements a lot too? So that's another thing that we talked about that's actually really, uh, really important. So this actually segues us into the next thing, which is working with the right people. You have to have a good team. So this is a, this was a, a a great idea. There's so many, obviously, again, like it started at Saturday morning at 10 o'clock and y'all showed up, which is very impressive. Um, and it's because of the fact that people really want to know, like, I'm a small brand, like how, you know, what should I be doing? What, what can I do better? What can I learn from other, you know, other examples? Um, these are, these are my people. I was like, these are people that I know can answer all these questions for the audience. It's a lot of it is putting together the right team. Whether it is, you know, outside counsel, you're like, I'm small, I don't have, you know, I, I can't afford to have somebody on staff. But what I really need is some advice because there's a lot of pitfalls to avoid. And um, there's a lot of pitfalls <laughs> to avoid. But having the right team um, is, is crucial. You have to have the person that is the go-getter, the person that, that doesn't sleep. You have to have the person that understands strategy. You have to have the person that's the creative person. So putting together the right team is critical. Um, that being said, there was a great example that, that Ryan had about something that you can prepare beforehand in dealing with a distributor. Well, uh, yeah, well, as in before you like, you, w when you're negotiating with a distributor. Right, so I, I have a lot of people who will come to me and they say, I want to get out of my distribution agreement and I didn't see the original agreement, but what happens, and Alan may be able to speak to this, maybe not, but um, smaller brands will get a distribution agreement that tends to lock you in for potentially ever. It's a, maybe a three or five year term with automatic renewal. Mm -hmm. And if you want to terminate, the only way you can terminate is if you pay a two or three times gross profit uh, penalty. So. If you would have came to me beforehand, what we would have done is structure it where, first of all, we push back in the penalty. Second of all, we have the terms actually end. And finally, we'd include things that allow you to terminate for cause. Um, you know, let's say they don't meet their bonus objectives for one year or two years in a row. There's a lot of different things you can put into the agreement that if you think about it ahead of time, you never know how you're gonna grow and you need to plan your distribution agreements, I think, uh, a little bit more in advance. What happens with smaller brands is, let's say Southern or whoever it might be says, yeah, I'm gonna take you on. <coughs> you're so excited that you're like, well, sign anything, but you need to take a pause and whether it's me or any other attorney that actually knows alcohol beverage law in the industry, they should read it so you don't get screwed in a year or two years down the road. Well, or 
I know that you say this, and I agree, don't sign a distribution That's agreement if That's it. you don't have to. We, but I, in I'll, some cases. My personal advice, and having worked with 500 brands, to give you a round number, is do not sign an agreement. If you're a new brand, do not sign an agreement. They are looking to diversify. If it's a little distributor, if it's a big distributor, they're looking for new products. They have made their business millions and billions of dollars on, in many cases, magnificent box brands. Those brands are not going away. They're still magnificent. They're still profitable. They also want to be brand builders. That's what we are as small companies, as small brands. They are not able to do that without the likes of us in this room. They will take you on. Not to say everyone, you may have to interview with several. In my opinion, there is absolutely no reason when you are first starting out to sign an agreement, the likelihood is, at least 50-50, is you will get screwed. Because you may have an, an issue where a better opportunity comes on. I'd, I'd rather go in and say, you know what? I respect your business. I respect your reputation. I'd like to start this on a handshake for 12 months. You don't know us. This is a new product. This is a new type of venture. I have not seen one time in 10 years working with a distributor and 18 years working in this industry where a distributor has said, no, sorry, we only signed three-year contracts. It's foolish. I don't think that's their prerogative at this point in time. So for, for me, I, I don't sign anything that locks me in. There are ex the exceptions are where you're in a franchise state and you say, um, you know, you're locked into a distributor. But I've had an example as well. Uh, our distillery is four and a half years old. We went with a distributor in the state of Connecticut. It's a small state. It's a backward business state when it comes to alcohol. It's right next door to us. Everybody that gets on that commuter train comes into New York every day. And they go back to Connecticut at the end of the day, and I want to be there. And we made a mistake. I went to them after a year and a half. I said, you're not making any money. We're not making any money. Can we both sign a letter to get out of this franchise obligation? And they were reasonable and said, absolutely. But I, I would not sign anything as a small brand, and particularly if you're just starting out in a marketplace or as a, a brand or, or company altogether. But I, th I think there's a point. I agree with you. I think you can go for a long time without a contract. But the, uh, in my experience, no contract also kind of means no attention. And then you get to a point when you've actually started to make some ripples to matter to the distributor because you're matting to the market because you're bringing sales to the distributor and the distributor wants an agreement. Because now all of a sudden you are a valuable asset. And there's a point in time when you have to find the distributor that's going to give you the best level of growth. That's, that's kind of happening. I, I, don't, I don't agree entirely. I'd say yeah. if you're making money for them, they're going to pay attention. This is what I was waiting for, well, arguments. If you're making money for this them, they're, they're going to pay attention. They're going to give you work with. They're going to say, they're going to take your meetings as opposed to once a year, once a quarter. You've got to get out on the street and pound the pavement and make sure those sales are there. They're not going to do it for you. But you all know that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. And I think, I mean, going back to the sort of the name of the uh, um, panel, how small brands can play big. Once you do get to the point where they do really want you, want to keep you, now you can s potentially start acting like the Pernod or Diageo or William Grants and have an agreement that it gets right. a little bit closer where you say, well, you're going to dedicate potentially one person in a new market. You're going to give me a dollar per case back into marketing locally for all of the brands you sell, which they don't give you, obviously, when you start. So that's when you can start acting a little bit more like a bigger player. And if you haven't thought of that, that is one of the reasons why you need to actually call this man because he does think of those things. Half the, half the things, like on our phone call uh, originally a couple months ago, he brought up and I was like, oh, that's actually a really good idea. Like, I should have recommended people to you a long time ago. Well, thankfully, uh, I was in-house at Pernod, so I saw what everybody was doing, and now I help people get big, you know, big level supplier services for you know, smaller brands. Does everyone get, understand what Ryan's saying about a marketing budget with your distributor? Because I, I wouldn't rush over that. It's a pretty okay, interesting no. point of view. So uh, all of the bigger brands have what's called a local marketing fund. So one, two, whatever the um, dollar valuation is for each brand, let's say it's $1 per case of your vodka. <coughs> The distributor takes from their margin and goes back into local marketing, which they can use for um, maybe they'll do their own sponsorship, maybe they'll use it towards uh, tastings, maybe they'll use it to create POS or, or retailer or consumer specialties. So they'll actually take money and put it back into your brand. And then legal bar spends. Exactly, all those different activities. And you can outline how you want to do it. And so what will happen is in the beginning of the year or at the end of the year, 
you'll talk about all the different things that you want to do and the different ways that they could use the, their money and you'll you know, decide on the best options. Uh, this, the last four and a half minutes of this panel have, are the exact reason why working with the right people is important right here. So thank you guys for being awesome. Uh, the, the next thing that we're going to zip to is marketing and promotion. Sorry, this one was too easy. Um, anyway, uh, one of the things going actually, uh, Dan, from working with the right people to marketing and promotion, it's it's actually, gr and distribution side, it's great to have that team where you have that person who has distri like distributor experience. You have that person who like, is the salesperson. You have the person that is the creative person. You have, so each member of that team really puts together, uh, you know, they're a piece of a whole. Um, then how does that translate into marketing promotion? What, what have you seen um, either brands that you've invested in or brands that you have not, but you've just seen out there, examples of people who have done j really amazing marketing as small brands, where if you didn't know who they were beforehand, um, you know, after looking at their branding, would be surprised that they are actually a small company. Uh, I think there's a lot of ways that small brands can play big, um, but I think when I, um, going slightly back to the previous point, but I'll answer this as well, um, a lot of um, entrepreneurs I see coming into the space, they haven't got a marketing background and um, playing at the forefront of being clever in marketing and drinks involves some pretty good smarts. And so a, lo a lot of the businesses, uh, the better businesses I see actually, you have a founder who recognizes that marketing <coughs> isn't their forte and are partnering with people who are smarter. So you know, there are a great deal of people out there who um, have worked around booze for a very long time and can help you with your business. There are a great deal of um, an increasingly number of brand ambassador agencies um, that can help you figure out what to do with, you, with your marketing, how to make it effective. Um, I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot more that people could be doing work by partnering with people to actually figure out what will make their great marketing. And if I could just make one very, Please. very quick point. Um, when you do work with people who are uh, potentially better marketers or advertisers or whatever, and they are designing things for your brand, sometimes mm -hmm. it's the label or sometimes it's the entire packaging or what have you, just um, I would suggest that you have a provision, the agreement, a work for hire provision that basically says that you own whatever that they're creating yeah. uh, for you. Hmm. As far as yeah. IP goes? Right, so the intellectual property side, so that you, whatever <coughs> they create, if they create your whole you know, logo, you want to own that and not have them own it, that's all. Is something you want to say on that, Alan? Oh, you're just giving a, a general nod? General nod? Okay. Um, so what you guys have in front of you right now is a perfect, the timing on these drinks is, I mean, I, I love my cap team so much, it's crazy. They're, they've really kicked so much ass. Um, this drink in front of you is a perfect example of working with the right people and also marketing and promotion. This is called the KC Manhattan, the Kansas City Manhattan. This is Jay Rieger and Co. Uh, Kansas City Whiskey, which came together just in general from being this really fun, oh, hey, by the way, I was looking up, you know, that there used to be a, this product, Jay Rieger and Co. Whiskey, that was a Kansas whiskey. What does Kansas whiskey mean? Well, I started looking into the lot. This is not me. This is Ryan Maybe in Kansas City. I was speaking in first person as him although he's a foot taller than me. Um, he was looking at what Kansas City whiskey really was, and it turns out that it can still be whiskey with up to 2% sherry in the whiskey. So he's trying to recreate a recipe that they can't really find, um, but because of the restaurant that they bought, it, th on the side of that building is an old advertisement painted on the wall for J. Rieger & Co. whiskey. And so he did some research, and the night that they opened, the only living, remaining living member with that family member with that name came in and said, hey, I just wanted to check this out. Congratulations on, on the new restaurant. This is amazing. And Ryan said to him, one point in the future, you and I are going to become business partners. And that's what you're tasting right now. This is Kansas City Whiskey <laughs> and uh, PX Sherry, Pedro Jimenez Sherry. And uh, Barolo Quinato. So again, we're using some small brands uh, for our general overall theme, but also a really interesting story about like collaboration and smarts and research and developing a, a, a new small brand based on research and uh, honestly, it was just, it was clever and amazing timing and hopefully you all enjoy it. 
Um, oh, and they're doing some pretty good marketing promotion by getting in front of 215 people today, so that's pretty good. Um, this is a good segue from marketing and promotion to growth. Managing growth. You can have this, what you consider to be a really small business, a really small brand, and then all of a sudden, for one reason or another, whether it was hopefully because of something very clever that you did, an opportunity that you jumped on, where all of a sudden, people are finding out about you. Well, how do you manage that growth? Whether it's scalability, which is something that um, you know, Dan can easily talk about, or that's just preparedness, uh, budget, um, your ideas of how to expand. Uh, so Dan, I want to ask you about like, what the things you look for as far as scalability goes in a small brand, and then I'm going to segue into Dragos talking about um, the, the Kaipedina kit and how you use that both as a marketing strategy and as a growth strategy. Um, so um, I think there's a temptation, um, and this is uh, to, to Ryan's point earlier, to go um, to try to spread yourself quite uh, thin across North America. There's so many states, there's so many people who will, our community is so strong, lots of people call you up to, buy, uh, to inquire about whether they can get your spirit in your state. And what we, uh, we believe, because of this kind of increased, uh, hugely increased number of competitors in North America, that you're, uh, managing your growth at the beginning is about really learning on your local market. Um, we reckon that the first kind of 12 to 18 months, you shouldn't even think about leaving perhaps your home city, let alone your home state. Um, because there's so much learning you can do in those early years. It's so much cheaper to do it locally. And by trying to figure out what actually creates velocity in single accounts in your home market, in your home city, in your home borough, um, those are the kind of secrets. If you can start to unlock them, but when you do start to grow, you're going to spend a lot less money actually um, learning in other states. So um, we did a talk on Wednesday around this particular subject where you know, the first 18 months should be learning at home. In, your se in the second stage where you're validating that learning, you might only go to one more state or one more city. Um, there is, um, the world isn't going anywhere. You've got plenty of years to become a, a, a larger <coughs> business. But the more effectively you can learn in your local market and the less money you can burn in those early years, the better you're going to be able to manage your growth. Dan, I, I, I agree with that. We did exactly that. We were in Washington State alone, our home state, for probably two years. And, and then we added Oregon, in the, which is a three-hour drive away in the, in the 30 or whatever. And that was exactly the idea. Hey, let's figure out what works and what doesn't. I'll tell you what, though. You start with the right strategy, the vision. You stick with that. What you're looking to find out is what are the vehicles that will deliver your strategy to the consumers? Don't change the strategy. That's good. Hopefully, you had a good vision, right? But Perhaps this sort of thing may not work. Perhaps this sort of distributor may not work. Perhaps you have to try pitching things differently. Perhaps the label needs a change. You know, there's so many things you can learn. Mm -hmm. And then once you fixed everything, you start. You can start going uh, abroad, yeah. abroad outside, outside of your home. One of the things we, we all talked about, and it was very important, also comes up in like the in your workshop and the Distill Ventures workshop, has been your story. You know, so you have to have the right people, yes, you have to have the right product, but like your, your story is very important. That's come up multiple times this morning alone, but that's a huge piece. Um, and as far as growth goes, I specifically want to talk about the Kaibedinia kit and then also um, the cruise line. Because sure. one of the things that Dan just mentioned was, uh, actually one of the things that you said that Simon Ford was talking about, he was just like, yeah, and you know, um, one year, uh, I opened six states, which was five states too many. Mm. So you really want to, I mean, it's again, and that's a brand that's a st st small brand, but we all know it. But it's a lot of work to open once, uh, you know, there's a small brand that I worked with. I opened 11 states in a year, and that was only like our third year in the market. And it was because, like, and I, you know, warned them against rushing to market. Don't rush to market. Don't rush to market. The, the but line I overuse far too much is you only knew once. When you go to a new city or a new state, You've got one chance to make a great impression. You uh, should make a card that says well, that. Uh, well, really, we should do, yeah. Um, uh, it's, uh, uh, in Europe, um, the distributors are really well networked, and so you will often get, if you're a UK-based brand, you'll get calls from, um, from lots of different countries to say, we'd like to stock your product in Germany, or we'd like to stock your product in Belgium. Uh, and I've got nothing against the Belgians, but I generally will say, uh, fuck Belgium. Um, <laughs> Uh, wow. Because you just don't need to go and ship product to different places. That when you, if you go there two years later and you actually visit and start to build your brand, 
you will um, some, you'll come across a bartender who will say, oh, I've had that for two years. It doesn't sell. What a great introduction for your product. Oh, <laughs> it doesn't sell. Uh, it's going to be very hard to convince him otherwise because the bottle's been on his back bar for two years not selling. So really stay local. Um, I cannot. Um, and I've, I've noticed um, I have a, a handful of clients who use third-party sales teams when they are not staying in their home state a long time. And, and some of them actually start out with um, third-party sales teams just in the beginning and are just trying to manage the brand on the marketing side. And although some are really good, I've seen a lot of uh, failures where they're, you know, they have a small portfolio, they lay on top of the distributor, they try to act as your local sales team, but they're still a third party and they don't necessarily work as well if it's your own feet on the ground and your own people. And you can probably do that easier if you have more money and the ability to stay in your own market and, and keep people close. Mm. I mean, sometimes that is the best way to multiply yourself is by working with, you know, a broker or a team like, you know, um, <coughs> Cornerstone Marketing, which is, you know, uh, our sure. friend Alex Strauss actually sat on your panel yeah, a uh, couple weeks. Yeah, as well. Yeah, exactly, uh, Bon Vivants. I mean, they, there, there are, are groups out there that have, like, their own team of ambassadors, and they, they really cherry-pick brands, products that they like in order to put together their own sort of mini portfolio uh, to get out there. And usually they're things that, again, like partnerships that work really well together, and they can sell multiple things together, multiple cocktails. If you're going to bring that up, though, you should have a very clear sense of what that costs. And the likelihood is it's forty to $50,000 per mm -hmm. market, Mm -hmm. annually Easy. as a starting point. Yeah. So I agree with the idea of focusing on your home market. It likely will be your best market forever. Uh, I could echo that we probably have opened too many markets too quickly in four plus years. However, <laughs> and when the rubber re meets the road, the challenge and probably the fear to a degree is also that there are only so many slots. There are only so many licensed distributors. They only have so much warehouse space. If you get an offer, the temptation is to take it because if they don't take your gin, they might take some other boutique gin. And I think that's a real possibility. So you've got to balance these things, mm -hmm. I think, in real time and real place. And the other is while you're focusing on your home market and those you know, concentric circles around where you're based is to know the rest of the markets that might be interested in what you're making. The two examples I can give is there's a friend of mine in Brooklyn. He's, uh, spent a lot of time in Korea and he's making shoju. It's not my expertise, but there is a tremendous Korean American population in Southern California. So he's taking advantage of one opportunity. He lives 3,000 miles away. He's not going to get there more than once, maybe twice a year, but he's going to get there because there's a built in demand that he feels he can take advantage of. For us, we don't distribute any products yet in Texas. But there's a rock and rye opportunity. And we've gone there enough times that we'll just start with the rock and rye. Um, to segue, well, first of all, in Southern California, tell him to call me. I've got a guy. you got a guy. I've got right. a guy. <laughs> um, and then, Dragos, a good segue from here from managing growth goes into putting in the hard work. Okay? So part of that growth, you, so on one hand, you don't want to dive in too quickly. On the other hand, you really want to start laying a foundation for, for growth and say, you know, national accounts. You can't do national accounts. The, the, the worst thing that can happen, other than going into that bar where your product's been sitting on the back bar for two years without selling, um, is not being prepared the other way around. So having that big opportunity come around when you know that the fit is good. Relevancy has to be high in order for it to work. That goes for events, that goes for partnerships, that goes for national accounts. Relevancy has to be high. If, you know, like some big Fogo de Chao decide they want to, you know, give Jago a call, it would be pretty amazing for him to get into 250 units. You know, that'd be, that'd be amazing. That'd be a, a big sale for him. But he'd have to be available in all those states. So if you get really excited and you go and you take that meeting, and they're like, ah, it's so nice to have you. Um, are you available in Maryland and DC and Virginia and Florida and Georgia and these other seven states that we, where we have our properties? And you're like, ah, yeah, maybe in like six months. They're like, well, thank you. Uh, come back when you're wearing your big boy pants. We'll have the conversation then. So on the other, on the other you want to be ready for that. That conversation actually happened for me. Were you exactly not wearing your big like boy that. pants? I, 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 it was like, go away, kid. Call back. 
when you have distribution out 24 states. It, it, it really was that way. So that's the other trade-off. We're talking about deep versus wide. You explain what, one trade-off, that's the other one. And I'll say, in my experience so far, the biggest growth in terms of dollar signs comes from national account partnerships. Those guys make a huge difference. You know, you go from selling a bottle in a case to a craft cocktail bar in your hometown to selling a container product to a national account at a time. Those things, that's the, that's the big cherry right there. Right? That's the thing that we all want. But it takes a long time to get there. You do need that distribution in 30 states. And as we've been talking about, that's expensive and you shouldn't hurry into it. So it may take years to get to that level, <coughs> right? But it is an amazing price to be able to get to that level. And it's also hard to get in because of what you're talking about, the Vegas example where you couldn't see a small brand. The contracts are gigantic in Vegas. And it's not just with Vegas, it's with the, a lot of companies, but there's something changing here as well. I love, I love this concept of, of progress in our industry. And what's changing is that as we're going from cocktailians in New York and San Francisco and Seattle and so on to the smaller towns and to the smaller and smaller and smaller towns and everybody's kind of coming below that top of the pyramid, cocktails are spreading to the base of the pyramid. Everybody's becoming engaged in it right now, right? So big hospitality companies are realizing they're going to have empty seats. They're going to have empty rooms in their hotels or empty cabins in their cruise ships unless they do cocktails well, not just poorly, but well. So now they're starting to reach out to folks like us because they don't know how to do it themselves. They have no idea. They don't have the, the, the they don't have Alan on, on their staff, right? So they're looking for Alan's, they're looking for Donnie to help them out. And these, these relationships eventually come to the likes of us. Now you just have to do the research, understand where is their gap, what are they looking for, and this is hard, a lot harder than it sounds, to find out what some kind of large hotel company needs in their strategic plan for the next year and present them nine months in advance, right? But you can do that. You can find that out. And you can present a solution that actually is the only solution they've seen to their problem because the big companies don't think creatively, right? So, yeah, we do have a relationship with Celebrity Cruises, which is great. We, uh, we launched it late last year with a couple of pilot voyages. And now we have a lot of different things going on on all their ships. And it's a beautiful relationship. So this is a company that probably last year had no idea what Cachaca was. But now they do. Now they know they need it, too. And they're willing to take, they're letting us do classes on their ships, cocktail classes, uh, uh, spirit classes. We have <coughs> things in their bars. We have things in their mini bars, in all the cabins, because we're, cre we're providing a creative solution to a problem they actually had. So this is a, a really good example of, of a lot of the themes that we've talked about all sort of rolling into one. So one is taking advantage of, you know, your assets. Um, they are a small company and the, with a product that a lot of people don't know or know how to pronounce. <laughs> For example, um, what's a sedia? I have no idea. Uh, so, um, and on top of that, you were prepared. You had to change your flavor around so that you could start talking to those national accounts, uh, whether you were ready for it or not. And some of those conversations take nine months or 12 months. Hold up the, the Caipirinha kit so they can actually see oh that. Yeah, so this is something else. This is, uh, you remember I told you guys about how we're on equal footing, small and big brands. And I think that's because consumers are a blank slate for the most part of these days. And I, I remember uh, being in a store in Nashville, a retail store doing, uh, we were doing some Caipirinhas and this guy came in and took a sip and he said, it was amazing. You know, this is my first cocktail ever. I said, no shit. Sorry, I'm not supposed to swear. This is your first cocktail Dan's already ever. done it. It's cool. Oh, you did it? Oh, yeah. Thank you. He said, yes, and this is my favorite cocktail now. I'm going to drink this all summer long. And I realized, wow, there's just this world of people out there, right? The base of the pyramid who does not know stuff beyond wine and beer. Those are the people we should go to because that's where the growth is, right? And so, that, that's also Dan's t uh, point of like you're only new once. That works on a lot of different levels and it works with like, you know, the consumers as well. It's only new to them once. So, you know, I'm sure that a lot of you go into some of these like big national accounts and you're like, oh, that's so awesome. There's like a mezcal drink on the cocktail for this like chain, this chain restaurant. And then you taste it and it's horrible, horrible shit. I'm doing that. I'm saying shit so that you guys don't feel like you're Thank alone. You so much. Um, it's terrible. And it's, and it's like, okay, cool that you guys have this product, but like, this is the worst, but having like a really beautiful caipirinha or something that's very yeah, simple so, so or a gimlet. Is, this is what we did. Basically, we recognized not everybody owns a shaker, and most people do not know what a muddler is. In fact, sometimes it's called a mini baseball bat. And uh, 
So we'll get a kit for those folks. It has a bottle of the silver cachaça. It has two jars, which serve as shakers and drinking vessels as well, and a muddler. And we design all of these so that they are brand consistent with our, with our, uh, uh, with our brand. And so the idea is you make the caipirinha in here, you muddle the lime and sugar, add the ice, right? And then the, and, and the cachaça, and then you use it as a shaker. And then you can take the lid off and you can drink. All you need is lime and sugar and some ice, and any person in this country can get those things together. So, and it's a, it's, a, it's a box that actually has a lot of information on it. You may not know what a caipirinha is, so you have a tearaway card right here that tells you the recipe. There's some information about what it is here. There's a URL and a QR code to a whole video series we did on the caipirinha campaign. Educational, entertainment, short, long, whatever you want to go, you have information coming right out of the spot. So it's an integrated campaign that goes, plays well in retail. Uh, and with these folks that are the blank slate of today's cocktail world. So drink this. Is, is everybody enjoying this one? I wanted to do this one as like the last one. It's like a refresher before you go back out into the hot, hotness. Um, <laughs> this is called maracujá fresco. It's basically maracujá is um, passion fruit, Portuguese. And did I pronounced that correctly? It okay, is. great. So this is the Nova Fogo uh, chameleon. It's a really great sort of uh, mix between the silver and the gold. It's like this perfect amount of age that makes it great for cocktails and gives it a, like a little <laughs> soft, like uh, some softness from, from the barrel. Um, also, to bring back other parts of, of our story in general about opportunity, what I really wanted to do was showcase the cachaça and also um, this really incredible passion fruit liqueur that these folks are making in the Dominican Republic that didn't show up yesterday. Exactly. So you One with all the fruit yourself. So I went. I ran around and picked all the passion fruit. I did not. Um, <laughs> what I did was it was just timing. Uh, I was I, I was visiting my friends from House Spirits, and they happened to have a passion fruit syrup from a company called uh, Libor and Co. in Austin, Texas, that make an incredible passion fruit syrup, and that is what you are having. This is essentially a bachita, so it is like your standard, you know, Brazilian. Uh, you know, non caipirinha, but that that other drink that's very popular, crushed ice, cinnamon on top, very little sugar in this. You get the the tartness, the real tartness from the passion fruit. You get a little bit of sweetness from that passion fruit syrup, and then the cachaça shines through, and it's really beautiful. Um, we have not time for questions. <laughs> we have not time for questions. Um, I have a, a panel here that all have uh, planes to catch, but what I would like to do is A, thank you for staying awake. We really appreciate it. Um, if you have any questions, please take down my email. I will connect you with anyone on this panel about any questions for follow-up. What? Um, okay. Except for, I'll give you a fake email for Dan so that you can't reach him. Um, and then also, please don't forget to, as you guys walk around, thank your caps. I had. You know, I had three menu changes, a, a product that didn't show up. It's really important as you walk around and you see uh, folks wearing cap shirts that you thank them for so much ass kicking. I mean, they really do a lot of hard work and don't sleep a lot. And of course, um, we can only get five stars. Please give us 10 for the best seminar that you had. And thank you so much to the panel and for you guys for coming. Really appreciate it.